Hello, Happy New Year and welcome to NARC Live on Wednesday the 5th of January 2022. Coming to you live from Norfolk on the east coast of England with Tammy M0TC. Hello. And me, David G7RP. On tonight's show, we find out all about what makes a software-defined radio with Mike G4WNC, but without any maths. How are we doing on the DXCC ladder just five days into 2022? And we find out what on earth is this? But first, your club news. And this when this Saturday, sorry, uh, is the first of the 2022 Koblenz skates with our twin city of Koblenz. As usual, it's on 7.123 megahertz. And there's a local call in as well on 145 250 megahertz. Everybody is welcome to join in on there. And they say if you want to talk to the net controller and you're in the Norfolk area, then you should be able to get through to him or her on 145 250 megahertz this Saturday at 10 a.m. And Malcolm G3 PDH also writes and says that Saturday is also the first of the RSGB AFS contests. This one is CW, starting at 1300 UTC on 40 and 80 metres. It's essential to read the rules on the RSGB HF contest website, he says. Uh, also, Data AFS will be on Sunday the 16th of January and SSB on Saturday the 22nd of January. Again, see full details on the RSGB contest site for all the details about entering that, the contest. Now, I had an email from Alan G800, um, probably about 10 days ago now, the first one, that says, the lockdown has produced some great NARC league results for 2021, and this is a record of the top 20 stations that have worked a lot of DXCC countries. The results are a total of countries worked and not per band. In other words, if you work the same country on all bands, it only counts as one DXCC in the table. To be in this table, you have to first upload your log into Club Log and then click into the relevant club's leagues and yes, you may click on more than one club. If you wish to see the full tables, go to norfolkamateurradio.org, then click on Line and then click Club Log and then click on this year or last year as it was 2021 and view the full results table. Now, as I said, he wrote that about 10 days ago, but then he sent me an update. In fact, yesterday, and he says, further to last year's NARC DXCC league table, I've just taken a quick peek at this year's DXCC table, and it's only for Tuesday the 4th. I'm delighted to record that we have three 2E call signs and one M5 call sign in the top 10 of this year's NARC DXCC league. In one, two, three, and five places, we have the normal high scorers. However, in fourth place, we have 2E1VEM with 45 DXCC. And in seventh place, we have 2E0DBS with 17 DXCC. And with 2E0OBO with 9 DXCC, followed closely by M5MSX with 4 DXCC. These newly licensed amateurs must be congratulated on entering the attaining and atten attaining these very high scores after only four days in 2022. Indeed. Really got on with their radio there. Amazing. Well done to all of you. So again, more information you can find out by clicking on those bits in the uh, Norfolk Amateur Radio Club website. Now, this coming Monday, as you know, uh, many of you know that Tammy and I produce a webinar for the RSGB every month called Tonight at 8. And this Monday at 8, there's a program which I think might interest you, particularly with what Mike's going to talk about tonight and, in fact, next week's subject as well. It's called How to Get Started in Software Construction with Heather Lohman, M0HMO. And it's all you need to get started in software construction is a personal computer, Windows, Linux or Mac. They all do. Some spare time. And if you want to make a thing then some loose change. There are three easy and virtually free routes into writing your own programs, develop applications that run on your PC using the free QT environment, write programs to run on one of the Arduino boards, which are about three pounds from China, using the free Arduino application, or go to the middle ground with a Raspberry Pi around 40 pounds and a Wi-Fi connection. 
Well, on this webinar, Heather will take you through the setup of each of these and show you just how easy it is to go from flashing an LED through to developing an ATV receiver to produce a fully featured Windows PC application such as Mapper, her Mapper entry in the RSGB construction competition last year. Well, for more information on this webinar, go to rsgb.org forward slash webinars. And that's this, when, uh, sorry, this Monday at 8 p.m. Next, I heard from John M6JAU, and he says, browsing my brother's bookshelf over Christmas, I started perusing an album of postcards. And look at this one I found. And he says it should be able to have copyright, so we should be able to show that. Now look at that. When the postman's knock, you hear, you'll know I thought of you, my dear. These words through few will bring to you my birthday wishes, all sincere. Wishing my niece all birthday gladness. I've got a closer, closer Oh, that's up a lovely there. picture, isn't it? Now, I wonder what radio that is. I bet you there's someone watching tonight who'll know what radio that is. Do you reckon? Probably. <laughs> I think so. If you know what that radio is, drop us a note on BATC or Facebook and let us know. I can't help wondering, though, that looks like one of those pictures that was taken maybe in black and white and then sort of colourised, do you think? Hmm. It looks yeah, kind probably. of perfect. Almost. Anyway, yeah. John, thank you for sharing that with us. Now, when I was a boy, I was uh, always told that money doesn't grow on trees, usually when I wanted something rather extravagant or expensive and my parents couldn't afford it. But if you're a resident of Hardwick, maybe that isn't the case. Because Tammy and I went to see Lynn and James M0 UKS a couple of weeks ago to drop off a Christmas present. But when we arrived at the door and stood on the doorstep chatting, I, I suddenly saw to my left, well, something rather odd growing in the trees. Tammy, can we have a look at some of the pictures? So this is their rather regular house. They've got some Christmas decorations at the front that James made there. Nothing odd looking about that. But remember, we were getting a bit closer, so we had a look at this. Can you see anything odd so far? Got a bit closer. And then I looked to the left and thought, what is that? And there it is. It's a hot air gun. <laughs> now, Do they James, grow on trees? Well, I think they must, in Hardwick anyway, because um, James was actually out working. Lynn was there. We were just going to hand over this present safely on the doorstep. But we, uh, we uh, expressed a bit of surprise, wondered if it was maybe a nice greeting for people when they got there to have a bit of warm air. A bit of hair dry. <laughs> yeah. But uh, she was rather surprised and shocked, and we... We helped to take it down and uh, found there was a little bit of water leaking out of it. <laughs> and apparently it's been sitting there for at least a week. So anyway, before you ever plug that in, please, please, James, be very careful. You know I'd be subtle and kind to you by telling you about this. So please dry it out thoroughly and, and open it up and check first. Oh, that was good fun. And uh, almost finally now, uh, you may remember there was... Yes, a co-presenter who tried to take my place a couple of weeks ago. Um, we saw a little bit on CCTV. But Bob G6PWS has sent us a picture of uh, that presenter being reunited with someone else. Have a look at this. Oh, is that a beautiful picture? <laughs> Lovely picture, isn't it? He says, he's in love. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> look at that. So he's taken off his Christmas hat now and he's gone back to... Possibly. ...to nature. In the loft. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, anyway... <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Lovely, lovely photo. It's I know you do some picture. cracking photos. That reminds me, we must, when it gets a bit, you know, a couple of month or two in, we must do another, one of our spring watch type yeah. things with nature pro pictures. So if you see something really spectacular in the next, you know, few weeks and we have these cold, crisp evenings and mornings, don't forget to take a picture or so, save them up and we'll let you, you know. Give you advance warning. We're giving you advance warning, <laughs> but it's a great opportunity, isn't it? Sometimes you see these things and... And nowadays, most of these camera phones, or the, sorry, the phones have got fantastic cameras on them. So take a picture and save it for us to share it with us um, when we get a bit closer to spring. Uh, just another reminder to you that uh, being in 2022 now, your membership of Norfolk Amateur Radio Club is due. Although we know that lots of people watch this who are guests and that's absolutely fine. But if you'd like to join our club, it's a reduced membership of just five pounds whilst we continue to meet online. Hopefully we'll be back to meeting physically and the price will have to go up more then. But if you join now, it's just five pounds for the whole year. 
And the details of how to do that are on our website at norfolkamateurradio.org. That's my waffle over. Tammy? I'll you're... just put that on the oh, side. Oh, right. <laughs> Norfolkamateurradio.org. There we are. I details of how to join that. are on there. Your little people. Little I don't, people. I, I yep. haven't seen this week, as I mostly don't. So share it. Share with your little people. Have you ever wondered how minions are made? Not really, to be honest. <gasps> That's how oh minions are made. <laughs> Is it really? And there's their little bed. Yep. <laughs> oh wow. So that's what those, I thought they were pills and tablets. <laughs> perhaps they are. That's brilliant, perhaps they're just little minions. I Ingenuity cool. of this, these Japanese people who run this website is fantastic. Miniature-calendar.com. Every day they have a new picture and Tammy picks one of the pictures out for us every week as well. Lovely job. So what have you been doing? Keep in touch, send us news, pictures, as you can see. Tonight's a great example of, uh, of you keeping in touch with us and sharing things with us and we'll be very happy to share them with everybody else. Just send us an email to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com. If you can get them to us by three o'clock on a Wednesday, unless we've got loads of things and we'll have to hold it over, it'll usually get on that, sh that uh, show that night. So please keep in touch. Now we're back to our competition and it's called What on Earth Is This? And hopefully you saw on last week's show or on the newsletter or on the website or on our Facebook page, this picture, because we asked you, what on earth is this? Hmm. Hmm. I must admit, when I first saw it, I thought it was a Lego character, but maybe that's because our house is full of Lego for the things you make. But, hmm. but what did you think? It's a bit disproportionate for Lego. Mate, well, you don't know the size, do you? No, but it's quite long and sort of thinish. Mm -hmm. Lego people are yeah, a true. little bit shorter and Stubbier. wider. Stubbier, yeah, okay. Stubbier, that's a good word. Okay, well, let's have a look at what you thought. Ken M0KJW and Shirley G0ZAA says, I suspect that this week's What on Earth is of a memory stick disguised as a hospital angel. I got a similar one as a Christmas Prezi this year, a memory stick design is disguised as a Freemason, which, as you know, is another interest of mine. Uh, Bruce G4KZT, it looks as though Tammy has gagged David at last what? <laughs> and shrunk him to become one of her little people. But why the hospital scrubs? Fantasies of doctors and nurses, what? perhaps. I think we should be told. No. <laughs> Bruce, I think you're getting your imaginations getting away with you. Um, Simon M0SIH says, the item shown on what on earth is this is a surgeon doctor USB stick. I recognise it as some of the health futures students at my school have and use a similar thing to save their assignment work to. Uh, Ralph 2 m 0 rht is it a Lego mini surgeon? I said he thought Lego maybe. Mm. Uh, used, used to get into your body when keyhole surgery is being used as he as he is just the right size, but he is not as good as looking as the real thing. <laughs> modesty, Ralph, modesty. Nev M0 NFY. I almost shudder when I get an you know, <laughs> entry from him. But I think we put that to bed last week, so we're okay. I think this week's What on Earth is an example of the government's latest NHS solution. Many diminutive Danish doctors and nurses are to be given work visas to fill the NHS staff shortages. They have the advantage over other solutions as they come completely encased in PPE. <laughs> Danish, you know, Lego, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. Like that as well. Oh, and then he says, oh, you've let yourself <laughs> down, Nev. P.S. Or they could be tiny sewing machine repair people. It could be. Could be. I don't know. I don't think no. No, I don't <laughs> think so. Paul G3VPT says, I think it is a Playmobil children's toy. And that's it for our entry. So anybody else? Let me just have a look at this. Is this Boris being gagged? <laughs> Says John, 2E0TWQ. We can't say things like that on here. Is there anything else? Uh, I don't know if that's meant for this. Silence of the Lambs, the silent ones from Tom, G0JSV. Just having a look now on Facebook. I don't, I don't know if anybody has entered. No, I think no, anybody no, else. So Tammy, will you reveal what on earth is this? I can reveal that it was a USB drive. Oh, uh, good. Two people got that right. Yep. Well done. You couldn't tell with his head, head on, could you? No. Well done. I think you didn't need to have seen something like that to know what it was. And we actually did have another picture of one. You read out Ken and Shirley. Well, they actually sent us a picture right. of theirs. Yes. 
looks the funny with the head one. on the floor. It does look a bit sad, <laughs> right, weird with that, Headless doesn't it? Headless sky. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Thanks for sharing that with us, Ken and Shirley. Okay, so ready for a new competition then. For this week, what on earth is this? Now, there's quite a lot of detail. I, I imagine you may not be able to see the detail in that control knob from looking on your screen, unless you've got a large screen. I know some of you watch this on a big telly, so you may see it there. But anyway, on, it'll be on the newsletter, on our Facebook page, and on the website in the next uh, 48 hours. So you'll be able to make your own mind up. And maybe that gives you a clue if you have a look at that. What on earth is this? As engineering and science type people, I'm sure you'll be able to get this. Send your answers to radio at dcpmicro.com by 3 p.m. next Wednesday and we will reveal all next Wednesday evening. So just to let you know what's happening at the club this week before we get on to tonight's guest. Uh, on Sunday the 7th of January it's the GB2RS News back on our repeater GB3NB from 7 p.m. On Monday the 8th of January at half past seven, the Monday Night Net, this week with host M, uh, sorry, Tim, M1MIT. And by the way, we do need some more volunteers to run things after this Monday. And at half past eight, the 80 meter CW net on 3.543 megahertz. Next Wednesday here, the 12th of January, I'm really pleased to tell you that we have a talk by one of you. We've asked enough and uh, Bob, G6PWS has volunteered to give us a talk on IT for the radio amateur. Bob was professionally involved with teaching and he's done a special adaptation of his slides for us as radio amateurs, looking at all aspects of IT and how it relates to us from basic things. So don't worry if you don't know much about IT, it really is for you. And if you know quite a bit about IT, well, as you know, we all learn at least one thing new every day. I'm sure there'll be something for you. And well done to Bob G6 PWS for stand, coming forwards. And we look forward to seeing him next Wednesday night here on NARC Live at half past seven. Plus, of course, send your stories and your pictures and everything else for us, as I said, by Wednesday at 3 p.m. to this address, radio at dcpmicro.com. And the same for this, which is our club card, which we're very happy to send to anybody who you'd like to receive a card from your club. We'll add your name to ours and sign it and send it off to anyone anywhere in the world. If they want to be cheered up, they've got a celebration, uh, just whatever reason at all. Radio at dcpmicro.com. Okay. Now, it's time for our, our main event tonight. Now, software-defined radios. Uh, radio is is the at the heart of most or at least many of the new radios that have come out in the last four or five years from the major manufacturers but it looks rather complicated even though it's now in the syllabus of the advanced or full license well here to explain it is someone who has been we've seen several times before he's going to do this in an easy style and without the maths he promises so it's really good to welcome back mike g4 wnc hello mike Hello, David. How are you? Well, good, good. It's great to see good. you again. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, no, I'm looking forward to this. This is um, a relatively new presentation that I've put out to a couple of clubs and refined it. So I think I've got to um, a reasonably well-defined version of it now. Um, now, if you... Um, I'm not sure how you want to handle questions. Well, you can save them up to the end if you like. But if you think a question needs to be answered while I'm on the go, feel free to interrupt me. And that's what we'll do, Mike. So as, yeah. as Mike says, if you've got a question that you want to ask about Mike, put it down at any point. If it's particularly pertinent to something he's talking about then, then of course I'll read it to him immediately. And if not, we'll leave it until the end. But you can enter your questions either on uh, BATC or on Facebook. And uh, we'll certainly read them out to Mike, either during or after the presentation. But now let's back, hand back to Mike and find out more about SDRs without the maths. Okay, thanks, David. Right. I, I put this together because I'd seen several presentations about SDRs. They were very good presentations, but we did soon get into quite a lot of maths. And if you're not an academic, some of the maths 
can be quite difficult to get to grooves with. So the idea was to put together a presentation which eliminated the maths as far as is possible. Um, and hopefully I've done that. Uh, you'll be able to tell me that at the end as to whether I've succeeded. So th this is the things I'm intending to cover. So first of all, we'll start off by what do we mean by a software defined radio? Then we'll look at some of the important basic principles that SDRs are built on. So it's important just to go through those things um, to understand uh, how it all sits together. And then we'll move on to looking at the different types of SDR and a quick look at the next generation of soft de software defined radio. So let's get into what SDR is. It's a very wide description, to be honest, um, because it's been around for a while. It's really just where some part of the radio signal is handled by software. And that can be as little as perhaps just a digital final IF um, and processing the audio at the end of it. Or it could be as much uh, as complete digital processing from the uh, antenna. Uh, now, here are the principles that I think we need to understand to make sense of software-defined radio. The first one is in-phase and quadrature, and that's the I and Q signals that you will have heard talked about uh, extensively with relation to SDRs. Uh, next comes the process of converting the analog signals to a digital format. So how we go about doing that. Then we need to get to grips with decimation or downsampling so we can reduce the high data rates to something manageable. And then we need to look at a thing called fast Fourier transforms, which is a mathematical function, but it's used uh, particularly to develop and produce the spectrum displays that we use. So we're going to go through all of those um, pictorially. So you can have at least a reasonably good idea of how they work and why they're important. So let's get on to the first stage. Probably the first introduction you saw to software defined radio, if you've been around in amateur radio for a little while, would have been the soft rock series of do it yourself SDR receivers and transceivers. Uh, these were direct co conversion units, uh, i.e. the RF is mixed straight down to the audio range. And uh, they look something like this. So you'd have a, your antenna feeds into a mixer and a local oscillator, which is running at the same frequency as the RF that you want to receive. Now, that's only part of the picture because there's another one as well. So you have the antenna feeds two mixers with exactly the same signal, but the local oscillator has one output that's called in phase, no offset at all, but the other one is delayed by 90 degrees. And the output of those are called the in phase and quadrature. Quadrature because it's a quarter of a wavelength delayed. So 90 degrees is a quarter of 360. And those would have typically been sent away to the sound card for digital processing. So uh, that's called a quadrature sampling detector. Now, the first question, if you've not come across this before, is why use I and Q signal? Surely you're sending the same antenna signal to two different mixers. What's the point of having two different outputs? What does it give us that you can't get from one? So that's where we need to move on to looking at, so what is it about IQ signals? They're at the heart of all SDRs. They're used in many other applications and a common one that you will have come across is um, shaft encoders or rotary encoders. The sort of continuously turning encoders that you find on most rigs these days and you may have used in projects. Um, quadrature encoding is used so that the computer can tell which direction you're turning the shaft. So not only do you get the number of clicks, but you can also tell the direction of travel. And it's the quadrature signals that give that. So the simplest way to explain how IQ signals work 
in an SDR environment is actually to look at modulation first. So we can demonstrate the principles with a couple of mixtures, mixers and a combiner. So here's an illustration. Um, use modulation to demonstrate. So we start off with a carrier oscillator and then we add a mixer which is fed with an I control signal. Now that can be a DC voltage, say from O to one volt. We add another mixer with this 90 degree phase shift on the carrier that has a Q control, which again can be fed with a DC signal. And the output of both mixers are added together. And so the output you get is the sum from both of those two mixers. So that's the way we can demonstrate this. And uh, I did this for my own interests uh, because I wanted it to be as practical as possible. You can actually build this circuit quite easily with a couple of mini circuits, double balance mixers. I used um, ADE ones, which are quite cheap, uh, together with a combiner to add the two signals together and a, a common SE5351 clock oscillator because that can provide the zero and 90 degree phase shift. And the IQ signals are connected directly to the IF port of the mixers because they're sensitive down to DC. So that's what we can do if you wanna make an actual practical test circuit and try and do some of these things later on. So let's look at what happens. So here is the output from the I channel and the Q channel. Um, now what happens if we combine those, if we add those together? You might be able to predict it, but I've shown below what the sum looks like. And there you have it. There is another sine wave produced, which interestingly is 45 degrees delayed. So if you look at it here, the in phase is the first one. The second waveform, which is the Q or quadrature waveform, is delayed by 90 degrees because of the local oscillator. But when we add the two together, we get a shift of just 45 degrees. So that's quite interesting in its own right. So if we move on again, so we start to think now, so what happens if we start altering those control values on the I and Q ports? So what happens if we change the amplitude of the I and Q control signals? So if we say it's a DC voltage on there, what if we take it from one volt and reduce it to zero? So this is what happens. Surprise, surprise. As you reduce the control signal to zero, then the mixers don't let any of the carrier through and the output is zero because it's zero on both of them. The sum will go down to zero. So what that means is we can create amplitude modulation just by altering the amplitude of the I and Q signals, as long as we vary them both at the same time. So instead of a DC control voltage on the I and Q control points, we could put an audio signal, for example, and that audio signal would then be AM modulated onto the carriers that are coming out. So um, that's all well and good. That's fairly straightforward. So what happens if we change the I or Q value independently? So let's see what happens then. So here we are. We're going to reduce the Q signal, the quadrature signal here. We're going to reduce that down to zero. And we want to see what happens to the output where the two are summed together. Now you might be able to predict what's going to happen, but let me just show you. So as we reduce that down, the output moves to be the same as just the I input. But the important thing there is just by altering the level of the Q signal, we've actually shifted the phase of the output signal, okay? So that's quite clever in itself. So if we wanted to produce some phase shift, 
all we have to do is alter the level of one channel. So what if we move on and reduce I to zero? So let's try doing that. Reduce this I signal, control signal down to zero. And the output moves the opposite direction, again by 45 degrees, because it comes back in line with the only remaining signal. So we can see there that that produces a positive change in the phase of the output signal. So what we've got here is by changing the value of I and Q independently, we can alter the phase of the output signal. So that gives us a very easy way to create phase modulation. Now to expand on this, in the examples I've shown you, all I've done is alter the I and Q values from one to zero but you can actually alter them to minus values. So both the I and Q can go to minus one as well. Uh, and if we do that, we're able to change the phase by up to 360 degrees in precise steps. Um, and as frequency modulation is just a form of phase modulation, what we've now demonstrated is that using those IQ levels, we can do AM, phase mod and frequency modulation. So there you have the important points about IQ. An easier way perhaps to see the effect of the IQ signals is to look at a polar plot. So we plot the I and Q values on a polar diagram. We can visualize any AM, FM or phase mod signal. So here's a few examples. In these, here we go. In these, you see the vertical axis is the Q input. The horizontal axis is the I input. And in order to work out what the signal is doing, all we do is measure the Q value and move across, measure the I value and move off. And where they intersect, the length of that line is the amplitude of the signal. And the angle at the bottom is the phase angle. So you can see that we can see that at anywhere on that circle. So if Q is positive and I is negative, we plot in this quadrant. Moving on, if I is quadrant and Q, uh, negative and Q is also negative, we end up plotting in this quadrant. And finally, over here, if uh, Q is negative, but I is positive, we end up in this quadrant. So you can see that um, the polar diagram shows how we can alter the I and Q values and actually create a signal uh, of any level of any phase. The great thing about this, although I've just shown you how it works when you're generating a signal, the process actually works in reverse. So um, we can process the IQ values in software to demodulate any signal. So we get back to this quadrature sampling decoder, which um, I started off with. We connect the antenna signal to both mixers with this quadrature local oscillator. And we can then use a computer to demodulate any signal by looking at the relative values of the I and Q outputs. So I hope that shows you that um, I and Q signals, and why they're so useful in software-defined radio. Uh, and if you've got doubts about this, I, I do recommend you build that little circuit just to try it out. It's fascinating to see it actually working in front of you. So the summary is with IQ signals, they provide a simple way to generate and demodulate any signal. Uh, they're used for the ge computer generation of all modulation systems, uh, and we can demodulate, demodulate all modes. Uh, the actual process of quadrature modulation and demodulation can be done in analog circuitry, as I've shown you by that little example. And that's how it's done in the soft rock, but you can also do it entirely in software as well. 
and all SDRs use IQ signals at some point. Okay, so that's the first principle done and dusted, hopefully. Let's now move on to analog to digital conversion. Now, th this has been around and quite common in amateur radio for quite a long time because it's been used for audio circuitry quite extensively. But let's just run through how it works. The first thing we need to remember about computers is they only handle binary numbers. So all we get to deal with is ones and O's. So to convert a radio signal uh, into a digital format, we do it by making lots of measurements at regular intervals. And when I say lots of measurements, I really do lots of uh, measurements. The simple rule, uh, which is the Nyquist theorem, is that you must sample or measure at twice the rate at the highest frequency or the widest bandwidth that you want to capture. So that means if you want to capture the whole 30 megs band from zero to 30 megs, you'll have to take measurements at a rate of 60 million samples per second or more, which is quite a lot of data. So here's an illustration of how the process works. So we start off with a, a radio signal. We then take some measurements. So at regular intervals, we will measure the voltage through there. And all those measurements will be added together to create a long data stream that flows from the analog to digital converter. So it's a fairly simple process um, of digitizing, uh, but there are a myriad of different ways to actually do it. Now, one of the things you'll hear talked about um, with analog to digital conversion is the number of bits that the analog to digital converter uh, delivers. And I've done these examples to show you what the different number of bits mean. So an 8-bit analog to digital converter, which is the sort of thing you'll find in a, a RTL dongle, uh, can only measure 255 steps from 0 to 255. And if you convert that to uh, a ratio in dBs, it means the difference between the weakest and strongest signal can only be 48 dBs with an 8-bit uh, analog to digital converter. So we can move up, we get onto the mid-range um, SDRs and we might have a 12-bit analog to digital converter, in which case there's 4,095, um, or it goes from 0 to 4,095, which is 4,096 steps. If you convert that to dBs, that gives 72 dBs of range from the weakest to the strongest signal. 14-bit uh, processors are also around, uh, and they give you 84 bits of range. And for the top end, uh, SDRs, uh, they use 16 bits, and you get 96 dBs of range. Now, those are theoretical ranges. You won't actually see those in practice because there's noise at the bottom of the range, etc. various factors which uh, restrict that. So generally speaking, the more bits that your analog to digital converter has, the greater the precision and the greater the dynamic range. And we're talking about the difference between the weakest and strongest signals. And there's just a repeat of the things I showed on that previous slide. So real systems offer less dynamic range due to a number of technical factors around the way the process works. So how do we manage the input? So if we, if we um, take this example, if we've got an 8-bit uh, analog to digital converter, and here's our signal range, maybe we could get signals from not far below 0 dBm down to the 130s, 140s. You can see it doesn't fit in this range of 8 bits. Uh, if you look at 12-bit, it covers a bit better. And 16-bit covers better still, but it still doesn't cover the full range of signals that we might encounter. So how do we deal with that? You see, one of the problems with analog to digital converters is if you overload them, they clip like most digital things. And everything goes nasty at that point. 
So you've got to keep your input signals within the range of the analog to digital converter, or you'll have problems. So the most common way of dealing with this is to use what's called a variable gain amplifier. Now, in actual fact, that the devices that are used with analog to digital converters, as well as being an amplifier, they also have attenuation built in. So they can reduce the level of this incoming signal and increase it. So in practical terms, what you're doing by altering the VGA, you can place your 48 bit wide um, dynamic range anywhere within the range of signals that are coming in. But regardless of that, you're still faced with the problem of you've only got a range of 48 dB from the loudest to the weakest signal. Um, so, um, so the number of bits remains important. Uh, and if you think of situations like maybe 40 meters when there's broadcast stations booming through and you're trying to receive a weak signal, then the chances are that there is more than 48 dBs of range that you're trying to deal with. So you will be limited if you've only got an 8-bit uh, analog to digital converter. So what's the output from an analog to digital converter? As you've probably seen from my earlier description, it's a string of ones and o's. It's just digital data, but it's a high speed stream of ones and o's. Because if you think of the 8-bit converter, um, for every single sample, there's eight bits of data being sent. Um, and so the data rate becomes the bit depth, i.e. whether it's an 8, 12, 14, or a 16-bit ADC, multiplied by the rate at which you're sampling. So for example, our uh, 8-bit RTL dongle sampling at 10 mega samples per second would give us a data stream of 80 megabits a second. However, if you go to a high-end SDR with 16-bit streaming uh, sampling, maybe as much as 128 megabits per second sampling, then you're over two gigabits a second of data. That's an awful lot of data to transport and deal with. Because remember, the data that's coming from the analog to digital controller converter actually needs to be worked on. Maths needs to be done on it to convert it into something useful. So as a summary on this bit, we've used a sample sampling process to convert an analog signal into a digital data stream. The data rate depends on the sample rate and the bit depth. The data rates can be very high. So now let's move on to fast Fourier transforms. Now it sounds an awfully complicated thing, but you can actually simplify it relatively easily. So how do we get a spectrum display? How can we convert a stream of ones and o's into a spectrum or a waterfall display? So you may have heard of the Fourier series. Uh, and one of the key points of the Fourier series is that any wave or form can be reconstructed using multiple sine waves. Um, it's a principle that's used in church organs, Hammond organs, and lots of other scenarios. Um, the interesting point about it is the same principles can transform a digital sample into its frequency components. And that's what we do with the fast Fourier transform. So it's a mathematical instrument that can convert a stream of data into its frequency components. And here's what it does. So you start off with a, a sample of the signal from the analog to digital converter, which is a whole series of ones and o's. It feeds into the fast Fourier transform, and the transform then splits it out into buckets or bins, as they're called. And the energy level in each bin shows how much signal there was at that frequency. So you can see here, you can start to see a spectrum display building up. And that's what happens with uh, the spectrum displays that we've uh, got used to seeing on our uh, SDR transceivers. So 
the FFT size determines the number of frequency bands or bins. And this is one of the things you can often adjust in your receiver. Yeah, you may see a section where you can select your FFT size. By way of an example, if you were looking at a 10 megahertz bandwidth and you had an FFT size of 10, each bin would be one megahertz wide, which would be very coarse. So in practical systems, uh, the FFT size is usually a power of two, uh, and you'll see typically numbers like 512, 1024, 496, et cetera. Now, one of the complications about using the fast Fourier transform is that it works on a sample of the digital signal. It doesn't work on the continuous signal coming in, it takes a sample of it. And the ends of the sample are joined together to make a continuous loop, which it can then process. Any discontinuities where the sample joins back together will cause spectrum, oh, that's a mouthful, spectrum smearing. Okay, it's a bit like a key click, if you like, is a, another way of explaining it. So in actual fact, real samples will rarely match if you chop them into a sample and try and bolt them together. So a window is a filter that's applied to the sample, which typically reduces each end of the sample to zero before joining them together. So let's show you with an illustration. So here's our sample that we've taken from an ADC. And if we look at it, there's two discontinuities. If we were to join this end of the sample to that end, you would see we'd have to draw a straight line between those two ends, which would be like a key click. Um, it would put a load of harmonics in the signal and it would mess up the display. So if we apply uh, a window of this sort of shape, what we end up with is a sample that looks like this. So our process sample starts at zero and finishes at zero. So we can then join those ends together without causing any anomalies in the sample. And that's what we do. So the sequence looks like this. You start off with the signal to be analyzed. You take a sample. You apply that sample through a window of which there's lots of different types. I'm sure you've seen them on your SDR. The window shapes the sample. It goes to the FFT, produces the spectrum display, and then the whole process loops around again. And that's how we build the spectrum displays that you see on all SDRs. And they're so useful, they're probably one of the most useful parts of software-defined radio technology. So to summarize uh, FFTs, we use them to display a spectrum of the captured digital signal. The size of the FFT determines the number of bins and hence the resolution of the display. So the bigger the FFT size, the finer resolution you'll see on your display. The downside, of course, is as the FFT size gets larger, so the processor loading increases and things start to slow down. So if you've got a really powerful computer, you can have a highly uh, defined uh, spectrum display. Okay, the, the final principle we're going to look at uh, now is decimation or downsampling. Whilst the wide spectrum displays are very useful, for demodulation, we only actually require a very narrow bandwidth. We don't need the full bandwidth that's available. So if you've, if you've got um, a flex radio or something like that, that samples from zero to 60 megs, we don't want to be trying to process all of that when we're demodulating. What we need to be able to do is to pinch a slice out of it and just work on that slice. Uh, and talking about the big um, top end receivers, those 60 meg sampling rates will give us around two gigs of data to deal with. Bearing in mind, we've got to do a load of maths on it. That's an awful lot. So it's not easy to handle. So what everyone uses to solve this problem is field pro programmable gate arrays. These are like a, um, a mass of logic gates 
all put together in one chip and they can be programmed to do different functions. The great thing about them is, A, they're extremely fast and also you can get parallel processes running in them. Um, this is a great way to handle high-speed data such as that coming out of an analog to digital converter. So they're often used to create the FFT spectrum and also to produce narrow band receiver slices that are then passed on to the computer for decoding. So let's look at an example of how that works. So if we, in this example, we've got shown down the left-hand side here, we've got uh, DC to 60 meg shown. That's the raw spectrum that we're sampling with the top end analog to digital converter. But for demodulation, we just need a slice that will go off to our narrowband demodulator. And that all we need is for that slice is to be tunable. So we need to be able to send it anywhere in the spectrum so that we could receive anything we like. And all we're passing to the computer for the next stage is a narrow band of the incoming signal. Now, so just to summarize that, the data stream's too fast to handle often. FGAs provide the initial processing, they reduce the sample rate, they produce FFT-based displays, they provide narrow band receive slices, and there can be more than one receive slice. Uh, you will find that several of the SDRs will offer you multiple receive slices at the same time, which is very useful. So that completes the principles part of this talk. Um, so if um, I don't know whether you've got any questions specifically on that area, David, you want me to deal with? Not, Otherwise, I'll not, move on. Not at the moment, no. I, I mean, this is normal, actually, that people don't ask questions tend to during it. Um, but, no, no, um, I understand. It's a question of... Um, but I must say, excellent. The graphics I found in particular, and I'll, I'll hold my hand up as saying someone, I'm someone who has not understood really how SDRs work. Um, right. and, and the graphics have really helped me understand, and I'm sure a lot of people at home. So to remind everybody Good. watching, you know, if you want to ask questions, you can do that on BATC or Facebook, and we'll read them to Mike at the end. Okay. Thanks, David. Right, I'll, I'll, um, I'll move into the different receiver types. This is um, it's just a quick run through some of the stuff that's around today. Um, the one that probably a lot of you have already got is the cheapest chips, RTL, SDR dongles. Um, they use digital TV and DAB receiver chip. Um, they have a wide range. They use an analog RF tuner uh, plus an analog to an 8-bit analog to digital converter. Uh, uh, and they cause something of a revolution in software-defined radio for amateurs and shortwave listeners because of an undocumented feature that enabled you to get the raw IQ signals over a USB um, output so you could process them with third-party software. And they spawned lots of clones. There's so many different versions of uh, RTL, SDR dongles out there now. But in my humble opinion, the best value is the official RTL, SDR blog version 3 which comes in at about £25. If you're thinking of buying one of these, um, this is probably the one to go for, in my humble opinion. This is what it looks like. I know it looks terribly complicated, but this first part here is completely analog. So you've got a variable gain amplifier, a tracking RF filter, a mixer, and a local oscillator, down to the first IF, and then a variable gain amplifier which goes to an analog to digital converter. And note here, the sine and cosine, which generate our I and Q signals, is actually done digitally rather than analog. And there it goes off to USB and the software to make it go. So these are, these are a big improvement over the original uh, RTL dongles because they've got a decent um, clock oscillator in them. Uh, and loads of things have been Im improved. This is a quick summary of the improvements. As you can see, this is their publicity, but um, lots has been done to make this a better unit. So if you're thinking of getting one, 
I suggest one of these. The early, the reputation as well, Mike, they had in the early days at least was that they were pretty deaf in terms of signals. Yes. Uh, is that still the case, or or is that is the, no, the, amp, the preamps better now? Well, a, a lot of the problem was people not realising that you had to turn the gain up. <laughs> right. Okay. They, they were very deaf. <laughs> yes. If you didn't turn the gain up, um, so you had to manually do that as a separate operation. But I mean, just looking um, at that, there's an extraordinary amount of electronics there for twenty five pounds, isn't there? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's phenomenal. Uh, and it's all down to mass production and set-top boxes that have made all this sort of technology affordable. Mm. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good device. Uh, I've been using one for a few years now, and it's um, proved to be very reliable. Uh, and, and you've also got an SMA uh, antenna jack as opposed to the awful TV one. Yes, that most of the others have. I remember that. Yeah. So it's the yeah. just to, to remind people again, because I know there's lots of these on the auction sites, etc. It's the RTL SDR version three blog. Blog version blog three. three. Yeah, it, come, right. it comes from the SDR RTL SDR blog, um, which is a regular news thing about RTL SDR stuff. Okay, thanks. In general. So um, moving on again to mid-range SDRs. Um, SDR Play is a very popular choice. Many people have got these. It, again, is based on a um, set-top box, but they use the Mirix uh, TV radio tuner, which is actually the same device as the FunCube Dongle Pro used, which was very successful. Um, but this, uh, this unit has been extensively fine-tuned and employs lots of RF filtering to control the various spurious signals you inevitably get with this type of device. And um, the SDR Play team were made of members of the original Mirix team that developed the chip. So they know what they're talking about, and they've done some very good work. And they've got their own bespoke software available now in SDR Uno. This is um, a simplified block diagram of one of the SDR Play models. So as you can see, there's two antenna ports. You come down, there's a switchable broadcast band notch filter, because obviously broadcast bands are a particular problem if you're into shortwave listening or amateur radio bands. So they've got a filter to knock out broadcast bands. And there's a 10 band selectable RF filter network as well. Uh, this, the MSI 001 is an analog tuner, which then goes into the analog to digital converter and the USB driver at the end. Uh, when you look inside, lots going on. Most of uh, the circuitry is actually filtering. Uh, down in the bottom left corner is the tuner chip. So everything up here above it and around is all RF processing and filtering. The other one that's popular, the two sort of vie for popularity in various fields, is the AirSpy. Uh, on its own, it's a 24 megs to 1.7 gigs receiver. But if you add the SpyVerter, then it's good down to DC. Now, you get a 9 megahertz wide spectrum view with that device. It can accept an external clock input for accurate frequency control. Really neat and compact. That's a photo of it. And uh, that's a look inside. Um, so very nicely made device and for those that want to experiment and really get into them it's got lots of um, ins and outs available you can configure this um, for other things the other one which um, I guess is a couple of three years old now is the SPI Discovery HF Plus now this was a completely new design which was done with the University of Ghent, I think it was. Um, it used cutting edge design with tracking RF filters and a polyphase RF mixer, which I'll just show you in a minute. It's a really excellent performing uh, radio uh, in the ranges LF to 31 megs and 60 to 260 megs. Uh, and the Discovery model has got some additional pre selection filters added to it. Now, this is the circuit diagram, or the block diagram, sorry, which is a little bit different to normal. The thing that makes it stand out is the fact that the local oscillator is split into 16 phases, and it has a bank of 16 mixers to go with it. Uh, 
and this is the polyphase harmonic rejection mixer. The output of all those is reconstituted to make a standard IQ signal, which then goes off to an ADC, and I think it's an 18-bit ADC in this model, uh, and then off to the USB. But it's um, the important thing about this one, I guess, is that it's bang up to date, uses the latest technology for this type of processing. Um, and it's very good. It's proved itself time and time again. So if we look at some of the high-end SDRs now, uh, Flex and Alan um, or Apache Labs stuff are good examples perhaps of that. They do direct sampling of zero to 60 megs as close to the antenna as they can. So it's primarily digital processing. All the processes are handled in software uh, and it supports multiple receivers within the rig. They employ field programmable gate arrays to handle the high data rates. And this is a quick look at a block diagram of the Flex 6300. So you start off with some antenna switching, some filtering, a preamp, a low pass filter to limit the range of frequencies going into the ADC, 16 bit ADC, FPGA to do most of the donkey work. And then that's followed by an ARM processor and a digital signal processing unit to tidy up the signals and provide all their extra facilities. Um, so it's quite a simple um, layout really for a top end transceiver. That's just the receive section, by the way. Now let's just finish off because um, I'm getting close to my time now. Um, with uh, next generation SDRs. So what happens next? We've got our 16-bit sampling SDRs like the Flex and the Apache Labs and also a lot of the mainstream um, manufacturers have now come out with 16-bit um, sampling SDRs. So one of the key things to do in the next generation of SDRs is to get rid of the FPGA. The problem with the FPGA is it's a very specific skill set to program it, which means you've got an expensive programmer to program it. It makes it difficult for uh, enthusiasts to seriously get involved with uh, this aspect of SDR. And the FPGAs themselves are actually an expensive item. So one of the things that's been worked on is to get rid of the FPGA and the reason we can do that now is because USB 3 speeds have increased so dramatically over the last few years that handling two gigabits of data is not actually a problem. Uh, and I'm in my, uh, my laptop. I've got a Dell laptop, and uh, that, that can handle on the Thunderbolt um, output. It can handle 10 gigabits of data. So it's, it's now getting quite common amongst the better PCs to be able to handle high data rates. And the other thing that we've got is that most uh, computers now have pretty decent graphic cards. And graphic cards are able to do much of the same parallel processing that FPGAs could do in the hardware version. So, so there's a real opportunity now to transfer a whole load of the work into um, the PC as opposed to in a separate piece of hardware. So this makes the receiver hardware very much simpler. So it really just becomes a high-speed digital sampler where you're just looking to take signals off the antenna, digitize them, get them in the computer and start working on them. So all our STR processing can be done on the PC. Now, the, the one that's that's most available, most accessible at the moment is uh, the RX888 Mark II, which costs around 174 pounds. It covers LF to 64 megs with 16 bit direct sampling. And it includes, importantly, the Mark II includes a programmable gain preamplifier and attenuator before the analog to digital converter. Because if you remember from earlier, even with a 16-bit analog to digital converter, we don't cover the full 
dynamic range of radio signals that we might encounter. So having the programmable gain preamp and attenuator ahead of the uh, ADC lets us move that range of signals to suit the prevailing conditions. <clears throat> uh, this can also accept an external clock input for getting accurate tuning, etc. Uh, there's software available to support this. Uh, the popular HDSDR software will support the RX888, as will Simon Brown's very excellent SDR console. Here's a photo of, um, of one. And the important thing to note about this photo is all the bottom half of this board is actually superfluous to the um, HF part of the board. This is a... <clears throat> um, uh, a, a TV uh, converter chip, much like the one in the RTL dongle, that's only used to provide VHF coverage. So if you're just after the O to 60 megs, all you're using is the top half of this board, um, which shows the antenna coming in at the top left. The analog to digital converter is underneath that heat sink. And the chip on the right here is the Cypress uh, USB chip that handles the high-speed transfer of the signal to the USB port. So it's literally only that that's doing the work al along the top. The bottom right-hand corner over here is where power supply stuff is dealt with. Um, so you can see it's a very compact unit and um, I've been experimenting with it here. Lots of people have. It works extremely well. Uh, and that's a way to get into the next generation of SDRs for not too much money. So I reckon that's probably about enough. There's a lot of information there <laughs> and uh, I don't want to bury you all. Well, no, I th it's been wonderful, Mike. Thank you very much for that. As I said um, earlier, you know, it's, it's been the most comprehensive demonstration really of SDR that I've been able to understand. I'm not great into the maths and software and things. so. I think at least we've got an appreciation of now what all the different parts do. Um, we've got a couple of questions, um, yep. but can I kick it off with one of my own? Just to say, as, as radio amateurs, most of us are experimenters and like to experiment. Um, and I yep. guess it's mainly because I'm a hardware electronics man, not software, that I, I struggle to see how someone like me could experiment very much, e even if I was into the software. How open is this stuff to actually play around with and experiment with? Um, well... <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, now, the first thing, the, the board that I've just shown you, this one. Um, sorry, this, Sammy's just this... going to show that, sorry. Oh, right, sorry. That's all right, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, this, this board does the donkey work for you. Now, it's difficult to modify this um, because of the nature of the soldering, etc., and the components are quite small. Uh, and, it, and it's easy to damage. So you would have to regard this as just a digital sampler. So it's what you do after that, where you have the flexibility. And this applies to a lot of SDR stuff. Even if you're using um, a, an RTL SDR dongle, uh, you wouldn't really try and build one of those, but what you would do is try and work on the other end. And the talk you're getting next time from Heather is quite appropriate because it's within um, a program or a suite of software called GNU Radio is where you can experiment because that's a pictorial programming language that allows you to build SDR functionality to suit whatever particular need you've got. And you don't have to write the code to do the decoding. All you do is put the blocks in the right order for what you want to do and feed it with a piece of SDR hardware. Okay, that's good, thank you. So there's quite a lot of opportunity to, um, to do that sort of thing. I'm just gonna stop my share, so I might get to see some of you then. Right, okay. Actually you won't, because everybody's just watching the stream, but that's okay. All oh, right, um, I can see you anyway. <laughs> just to, yeah, that's right. Just to share, because share, uh, it was mentioned earlier, but for people who just joined us or didn't take it in quite, the talk that um, Mike mentions is actually on not on NARC Live next week. It's on Monday. It's called Tonight at Eight, and is, a, ah. is an RSGB production, um, a webinar at eight PM on Monday. And you can find out more details how to join that, and it's completely free. And you'll be able to watch it just like this. 
um, at rsgb.org forward slash webinars. And although we'll be hosting it, it's not NARC Live. I just wanted to clear that up. But as you say, it's a, a nice coincidence, actually, that the two talks will yeah. probably go hand in hand because I think Heather's going to go into the real basics of how you can make software do lots of things. Um, I'm going to yeah. get you some of the questions now that we've said. Um, yeah, sure. A little bit further back, Tom G0JSV said, I agree, lots of clones around for the rtlsdr.com, but go to the official site and look for the curve on the case, he says, as a bit of a tip. Yes, that's true, yeah. All right. Um, he comes back as well and asks a question. Uh, do you think the term software-defined radio, SDR, is too broad, a big net catching a lot of fish? And also, he asks, Mike, which radios do you have in your shack, SDRs versus traditional radios? Okay. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it is a huge term. We can't change how it's being used, of course, but... Um, yeah, it does cover so many different things that just to say you've got an SDR doesn't actually is meaningless, really, because it, it could be anything from an RTL dongle to a Flex 6300. Um, so, yes, I agree that that's not very helpful, but that's just how things are, really. Um, in terms of what I use, um, I've got the RX88 Mark II. In fact, I've got a Mark I as well. My main rig is a um, device called a Hermes Light 2, uh, which is a, was a self-build, um, which is, is derived from the what's called the high-performance SDR project, which has been running for many years now. And the um, Apache Labs uh, Anan transceivers are based on those principles and those designs. The, Hermes Light is a low power version of it. Uh, so it's uh, just five watts output. And for doing data modes that I often do, that's plenty. Um, I have got an amplifier I can put on the back of it. But most of the time I'll use that uh, when I'm operating. Uh, I've got a, uh, an FT897 here as well. But to be honest, it doesn't get used very much because I use the SDR ring most of the time. Receive wise, I, I'm very fortunate in that I've got a lot of the common SDRs. So I've got SDR Play, I've got Airspire, I've got Discovery Plus, um, mainly because I've had them and used them and uh, done a lot of work with them over the years. So um, I, th I think once you get to use SDRs, you become so spoiled with the spectrum display where you can see all the signals around where you're operating, uh, the click to tune, the infinitely variable bandwidths are just so useful. Um, so uh, and when I compare that to the days a very long time ago when I had uh, an AR, no, a Raykel RA-17, mm -hmm. uh, it's a hell of a difference. It's moved on. <laughs> I mean, do you ever, can you, it looks like a lot of the SDRs, and especially the lower cost ones, are receive only. So is there yeah. an easy way, do you think, of meshing that in with a traditional transmitter like maybe your, uh, or transceiver rather, like your 897, and sort of making that the transmitter, but using the SDR part as receive? Is, I mean, just asking that as, a, as an optional question, really. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Uh, there's no reason not to. You've got a slight processing delay between the two, but you can do that. Um, what sort of latency of people, are we talking about difference? Oh, it's only a short delay. I can't remember what sort of... Just milliseconds, level is it? Not, not, yeah, yeah, not it's, significant it's amounts. Sh short, no. And there are a lot of people that use SDRs effectively as pan adapters on their standard rigs. Mm. So they get an SDR to view a wider spectrum. Mm. Um, and you can enjoy the benefits of SDR filtering, etc. So they get the spotting the effectively that they can do with looking at the spectrum with the SDR yeah. alone, and then maybe using their traditional transceiver. Yeah, yeah, you can do all sorts of mix and matches like that. Okay. Uh, a reminder yeah. to everybody at home, though, we, we're looking for questions or comments or anything for Mike now. Uh, we've still got a few left to read you, though. Um, okay. From, uh, were you going to say something then, sorry? No, no, no. Okay. A Malcolm G3PDH says, does the RX888 methodology, uh, methodology reduce any processing delay compared to such as the flex system? This is important for transceivers. And he also adds a PS. He's got the flex 6500 himself, and it's a brilliant performance. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I like the flex range, I must admit. Um, 
I th think it was the 6300 I reviewed when it came out, and I was very impressed with it then. Um, they, make, they make nice kit. Do you know, I can't answer that on the process in place because I really don't know what they are. Um, so I won't try and make something up. Um, but, yeah, I really don't know offhand. No, that's okay. And um, by the way, I would mention as well, you were generous enough in our exchange earlier this afternoon just to, to let people have these slides for their own personal use. So if anybody at home wants a copy of these slides, because particularly the animations and things are good, and so they could go through them maybe at their own pace, if you drop me an email to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com, and I'll send that to you just for your own use. That's the only condition I think is quite a reasonable one. Um, the Air Spy, we're looking back at that, that, that had some headers and things, which as an electronic engineer myself, you know, r rang my bells and, and I thought, well, maybe I could do something with that. But again, it's just the software that, that worries me. How would I manipulate that? Or how would I make use of the, the, all of the uh, data that was on those pins? Yeah, it can, it can be tricky to uh, to do that, and that and it is really where the GNU Radio software comes into its own. Um, and and I would commend people to spend some time on that. Uh, I've I've got in mind to uh, write an article or a series of articles, or maybe even a presentation on it uh, at some point because it's it's the modern version of um, Homebrew for SDR because it's, it's a playground where you can do all sorts of things. And the great thing is once you've got the hardware, it doesn't cost you anything to do all these experiments because uh, you can do them by bolting stuff together in software. So okay. it's really where we need to be going. Yes. Thanks. Well, you've mentioned GNU radio again, and um, we've got Heather, as I said, as a guest on tonight at eight on Monday, but she did talk about GNU Radio before, and I was just talking to Tammy actually to, to try and remember whether it was for NARC or whether it was for the RSGB. Um, and uh, I, I think we think it was for the RSGB. So the talk on Monday, yeah, I, I think, think is so. going to be about software programming. But you will be able to find that um, again on the RSGB webinars page that I told you. Their YouTube channel has got all of these videos stored on there. I think it was around about a year, year and a half ago. But if this has spurred you on to have, have a look at so GNU radio and, and experiment with SDRs. If you if you're really interested in experimenting, and not just using the the SDR, um, then have a look at that on the RSGB website, rsgb.org forward slash webinars. Um, now we've got a, t uh, a couple of questions now from um, Rick M7 GMT. STRs work great as a pan adapter, as you said. Just remember that you'll also need an automatic switch to ground out the STR when you transmit. Good point. Which is a good point, yep. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's a brackets there so you don't fry the front end of the STR. Yes, of course, because they're going to be yeah. very sensitive to that. I guess that's what I was sort of asking was, you know, is it very complicated to make a switch which uh, pushes the PTT, the push to talk on the transmitter? But um, as Rick says then, you've got to make sure that you actually completely shut off and protect the SDR, otherwise you'll just blow it with your strong transmit yeah. signal. Uh, if you if you take a look at um, the website for uh, SV1 AFN, Sierra Victor 1 Alpha Foxtrot November, uh, uh, Mattus there has done all sorts of accessories. Uh, the little electronic modules he does, and one of the things he does is an automatic um, protection unit for SDRs. So it will protect them against you inadvertently whopping a big signal in there. Thanks. Right. That's, that's, okay. that's a really good point. Um, John Jarvis has said on Facebook, Mike, Hermes Light 2 is a fantastic transceiver, well worth buying when maker fabs go back into production. That's John G4NEY. Yeah, it is. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant little rig. Um, I'm quite happy to live with that one. Um, <laughs> it uh, it performs very well, surprisingly well for what it is. Um, and Maker Fabs have been doing the production for um, Steve in America, who sort of led the design of it. Uh, but like everyone else, they've had problems with components following COVID, etc. So they're temporarily out of production, but I'm sure they will come in as as things get back to normal. Yeah, sure. Um, Jim G through YLA says has used SDR since soft rock days, and in fact I remember sitting 
in my lab with Jim making one each. We did that for oh, right. for not yeah, I they think, were great. when we used to meet in real. Yeah, I've just remembered that. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he said, have used SDR since soft rock days and can't see me going back to traditional rigs. Lots of modern kit, etc., outside like Flex, etc., allow software interaction via APIs. So plenty of experimentation is still possible. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's some there's some new things to get to grips with, but a lot of these, um, one of the things that's been developed, which is not it's not part of GNU Radio, at least I don't think it is, is uh, Soapy SDR. It's called, um, but uh, it's a, an interface to a whole load of radios, so you can use the same command set to change the same things on different radios. So if you want to change the frequency. You put that command into SOPI SDR and it converts it to whatever the destination rig mm. needs to see. So there's things, there's all sorts of tools like that out there where you can decide what you want to do. And these tools will do the hard bit of converting it into the language for that computer, for that rig rather. So That's good. So there's a sort of halfway house between writing your own code and things at the bottom, yeah. you know, the, the bottom end and then um, using something off the shelf like the Flex. Um, yeah. with their system. Uh, yeah. Tom, Tom G, G, sorry, G0JSV comes back and says, Mike, I have a few SDR radios in the shack. Have you had a chance to play around with the expert electronics radios like the Sun Pro 2 and DX, etc.? Yeah, I reviewed one when they first came out. I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good radio. The software that came with it was very good at the time. Um, uh, and it was quite a while I did this. Um, uh, Martin Martin Lynch provided it, I'm pretty sure, and I and I reviewed it. I can't remember whether it was for PW or Radcom, but I remember reviewing it and uh, thinking that it was a really good rig. Mm, good, thank you. Uh, Tom Miller on Facebook has said, any comments on my SDR Play RSP1A, which I've had, I've put on the back burner until I learn how to use it, he says. <laughs> yeah. Any good, so extending that question a little bit, are there any good guides for something like the SDR Play to actually get it into operation and get to get your head around it? Well, there's quite a lot of tutorials on their site, actually. They've improved that enormously over the years. Um, and so you can see quite a lot of tutorials. And also, if you search YouTube, you find lots of tutorials on it because the SDR Play series have been about for a very long time now. So uh, lots of people have had a chance to put together tutorials and play with them and work out how to make the best use of them. Yeah. Well, look, Mike, you've given us lots to think about. You've shown us how an SDR works, <laughs> what, the, what it works out inside, and given us lots of pointers on how we get started, starting with that £25 um, dongle, which, you, you yeah. know, with that, I guess there's lots of free software out there as well to sort of start thinking there with. Is. Um, and then yeah, right yeah. up to the high end thing. So thank you ever so much for coming back to NARC tonight to deliver this talk. We've uh, we've really learnt loads. I, I know that. By, okay. And actually the quiet, the, the relatively few questions means that I think people are sat as well as I am with what you've shown and can't wait to get hold of a uh, maybe a soldering iron and certainly some plugs <laughs> and some USB cables and things to clip this stuff together. So thank you ever so much for joining us, Mike. Take care. Can I do a little plug? Of course you can, yes. Before I go. Please do. I, I, I usually don't plug my books, but I've just finished writing a book on the Nano VNA ah, uh, okay. for the RSGB, uh, which is a guide to how to actually use it to do things. Um, should be coming out in February, I think. All right. And what's so that going to be called? Uh, Nano VNA Explained. Lovely. For radio amateurs. Okay, well, that's good. That'll complement... Hot off the press, that is. A few, I mean, I get a bit muddled up because we do so many different things for different people. But I think we did a talk with, probably on the RSGB tonight at 8, with Alan Walkie. You've probably heard of oh, Alan yeah. in the States. Yeah, and yeah so he's this, very good. A book would go really well hand in hand with that because there was a lot of stuff that he covered. So um, for people who saw that talk, um, that, that book we'll look forward to. Actually, I think we've got your uh, web address, um, actually, for your website as well, because although you said you don't advertise um, uh, things very much, I know that you do some pre-programmed cards and things for Raspberry Pis. Um, I do, And that, yeah. that really does make it easier for people. So I don't know, if Tammy, if we can have a quick look at that. Now, we've got it here. Here we go. It's this here, HTTPS forward slash forward slash photobyte.org and that's Mike's website isn't it Mike? 
It is, yeah. You can get me on g4wnc.com as well. That goes to the same place. Okay, good. Well, you didn't ask me to do that, but I, I did a bit of homework Thank earlier you. on and found that. <laughs> no, but there's lots of useful resources as well. And as I mentioned earlier on as well, um, you know, you, you can, um, you've, you've kindly offered to lend those slides out or give them out to anybody for their own private use. So once again, Mike, G4WNC, thank you ever so much for coming back on Night Live. My pleasure. <laughs> thank care. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Uh, we are. And that's uh, Mike's talk. It really has explained SDRs a lot to me. Um, I've got a Flex. Um, which is a nice box and it does it all, but I have no idea how it worked inside. Maybe I've just got a little bit of an idea now of what goes on inside, and I hope it's helped you as well. If you do want a copy of those slides, then please drop me an email to the usual address, radio at dcpmicro.com, and I'll send you that slides, including all those lovely animations that Mike did. But that's about it for Narc Life for this week. Uh, just to remind you again what's happening on the, at the club, uh, over the club, the next few days. On Saturday, of course, we've got the uh, Koblenz Sked on 7.123 megahertz at 10 o'clock uh, with a 145.250 VHF local call-in if you want to do that. Uh, on Sunday, the 7th of January, we've got the GB2RS News at 7 o'clock on GB3MB. That's back after the Christmas break. On Monday, the 8th of January, the Monday Night Net with host tim m1 mit and you can get in there quick if you want to see that talk with uh, heather all about software applications and things like that that's at eight o'clock on the rsgb tonight at eight channel that's live um, or you'll be able to watch it afterwards as well it's recorded and you'll better catch that and at half past eight the 80 meter cw net on 3.543 megahertz and next wednesday here the 12th of january it for the radio amateur with our own bob g6 pws Look forward to seeing that. And remember, as I've said before, if you've got a talk inside you, we would love to help you deliver it to the club. And it would be really, really good, as well as these professional speakers that we have come and join us. It'd be lovely to see some homegrown talks from members. And I'm sure lots of you have got something like that that you could do for us. But that's about it. Don't forget to send us all your news and views and stories and things by 3 p.m. next Wednesday to this address, to, sorry, to radio at dcpmicro.com. But from now, from Tammy M0TC. Goodbye. And from me, David G7RP. Take care of yourselves. Keep warm. And we'll see you again next week for NARC Live. Bye-bye.